Hey guys, how's it going? My name is Patrick. I'm the youth pastor here at Temple Baptist Moss Point. I just wanted to uh, bring you something that was on my mind um, and, and maybe share it with all of you. <coughs> um, I'm not super good at, you know, constructing beautiful sermony things, so I'm going to just focus on what the Word of God says. Let's take a minute and um, just listen what he has to say. And if you don't mind, um, I'm going to read from uh, First Peter, which uh, it's a pretty commonly quoted book of the Bible because it is so important. One of the great things about the New Testament letters is that they are uh, a standalone commentary unto themselves, which is to say that despite the complexity and the depth of the Old Testament, it's very often very difficult to understand all of it. So reading uh, books of the Bible that are in the New Testament, that are the letters, are often great explanations of the harder concepts that aren't often shared in the Old Testament, or at least expressed verbally. So um, great examples there would be the book of Romans, the book of Hebrews. But right now, Peter's letter to his church. Here we go. Starting in chapter 3 at verse 8. And a, an important thing happens in the middle of it. We'll get to that in a second. He had been writing to a whole bunch of others. Right now he's speaking to the church. That's you. That's me. That's everybody who believes on Christ and is willing to obey his commandments. The temple of believers. Those who have been saved and are being sanctified in him right here it gives instructions for further sanctification all of you be like-minded and sympathetic that's uh, that expresses kind of unity among the church not saying that every doctrine of every parishioner of every person who walks through the door needs to have the same opinion on every little thing but it is saying that we need to be willing to put something first oh look it's next it says right here love one another and be compassionate and humble not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult but on the contrary giving a blessing since you were called for this so that you may inherit a blessing um in just a few minutes, Brother David's going to speak today about what it means to face somebody who's insulting you and to tell them the truth, tell them that you love them, and even to pray for their benefit, to bless those who've been cursing you. It's not an easy thing, but it's an absolutely critical thing. It's got to be a high priority in the scope of the life of a Christian. So... Why would we do that? Since you were called for this, so that you may inherit a blessing. The inherited blessing here is acceptance into the kingdom. Uh, Peter quotes from the Psalms, in fact, Psalm uh, 34, verses 12 through 16, right here. It says, For the one who wants to love life and to see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit let him turn away from evil and do what is good let him seek peace and pursue it pursue peace because the eyes of the lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer but the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. So it raises a question right there. What, what is it like to be the one who has the Lord's eyes upon them with joy and mercy as compared to one whose face or who the Lord's face is upon them with judgment and wrath? Um, 
It's a hard thing to, to put into words, but I can tell you this. It is only through Christ that we are righteous. Let me rephrase that. It is only because of Jesus Christ's death on the cross that we are counted as righteous. That our deceit and our selfishness, our cruelty and our malice have been waived, paid. The penalty for the wrongdoing we've done to our sisters and our brothers, our mothers and our fathers, our children and our friends has been already paid. Could you imagine the penalty for murder in the eyes of God? Could you imagine how severe it would be to face God and say, yes, I killed someone. Bring your judgment onto me. I, I deserve it. The truth is we can't face God and not tell him the truth before him. He's... His righteousness is so high. His holiness is so huge. In comparison, even our thinking about doing wrong is awful. And the penalty for even thinking not well enough about God is death. That sounds like bad news. Well, if you're listening to this and the first portion of the statement applied to you, the church, then this applies to you now. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ took that penalty on himself. He brought it to the cross and he died for us. If you have that knowledge in your heart, if you have trust that that sacrifice paid the price then you're free of all of the pain that's to come because of the suffering that we bring on ourselves and each other that doesn't mean that suffering today won't happen it does mean that suffering today is only temporary what about people who are being unfair what about people who are treating you like a criminal even though you've been trying your best to be a good person, to be right in the eyes of God and man? Let's take a look. Here we go, going straight to verse 13. Who then will harm you if you're devoted to what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you're blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect. I got to break this up a little bit. I'm sorry. This is so huge. This is is probably one of the most important paragraphs that we as believers need to apply to our lives outside of the building of the church. See, the old church, back in the formative years, the first 500 years of its history, was a lot like the original uh, Jewish gathering of followers. See, the thing is, in ancient Israel, different subgroups of thought were common. That's why you see groups like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes. That's why you see divergent opinions on interpretation. And that's why you see today different denominations. The real difference today between a Pentecostal or a Southern Baptist, a Lutheran or a Catholic, is that one has said, this is the way the scripture is to be interpreted. And if you don't agree with me, you can't be here. And another has said, this is a different way to interpret that scripture. And if you don't agree with me, you can't be here. 
The difference is exclusivity. What did verse, what did the very beginning of it say? Look, finally all of you be like-minded. What's the first most important thing? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So, when somebody brings harm to you for doing what is good, that's great. Kind of. Okay, let me ratify that slightly. The thing is, doing good is a hard thing to nail down, just like actually being righteous in God's eyes is an impossible thing for us to do. But we are called to do it. How can we do it if it's impossible? How can I, a normal dude, right, manage to get counted as righteous in the eyes of man? There's, there's no human being who's going to look at us and say, I'm going to count you as I counted Jesus, unless they're a Christian, unless they're a true follower of the Jesus Christ of your Bible and mine. So, even if they should suffer for righteousness, they are blessed. Do not fear what the world fears or be intimidated. But in your hearts, regard Christ, the Lord, as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Now, if you want to start memorizing Scripture, everybody's got John 3.16 memorized, Romans 3.23. How about you memorize this one? All right? It's where the term apologetics comes from. See, it says right here, but in your hearts, regard Christ, the Lord, as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason that, uh, for the hope that is in you. Why do you have a reason for the hope that's in you? What is your reason? Apologetics is the study of the reason for the hope that is in us, the defense of our faith. But that doesn't mean cunning arguments and Facebook wars and debates in thousands of comment threads on Insta, in Insta tweets. Gram chat. It's one of those. Um, in fact, it says here, verse 16, yet do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. How many times have you seen something online and had the opportunity to comment? To snap back. Something online that made you mad, made you think these people really need to be set straight. What happens if you don't comment? What happens if you make a comment out of love? Somebody says something awful on Twitter. Do you benefit them? And more accurately, more importantly, do you benefit everybody else's perception of the kingdom of God? Because as Christians, we're witnesses. We stand and say, Christ changed my life. We've got to act like it. We've got to act like Christ changed my life. If you're having trouble acting like it, then Christ hasn't changed your life. It's kind of a thing. I'll explain later. If you've got questions, feel free to call, text, um, email, message me on whatever. But look, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. Who's ever seen that happen online? Who's ever seen somebody say something mean, hateful, insensitive, or bigoted, and then somebody else get on there and say, you're a jerk. He shouldn't have said that. All right, we've all seen that tons and tons of times. What about when somebody instead says, I know what you've been through is hard, and I know you're coming from a place that seems logical to you, but what you're saying can be hurtful to people, and you're not mindful of it. So please, out of the love you have for me or whoever you care about, think before you post. 
how do you think the commenters after that point would respond to your comment? Would they continue spewing vitriol and hate? Or would they just say, <sighs> all right, they say this thing. I gotta, they're, they're, the truth is they're either going to ignore it or they're going to respond in love. I know this because I have been there. When I learned how to stop arguing on Facebook, man, it changed my relationship with Facebook. I developed this amazing new power. Check it out. You ready? I took my phone. I put it down. I don't need to argue, to debate, to defend from an attack the reason for my faith. Instead, if someone asks me, this is what he's talking about, Patrick, why is Jesus so important to you? Then I have an answer. And for that, I turn to Scripture. Can you? John 3.16. This is where the memorization of Scripture is good. Always be working on memorizing Scripture. Okay, finally, this is the last one. For those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be, whoa, 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 whoa. I slipped. I did one of those column shifts where you finish reading one side and then you go back and you start on the same line you started on, so it would have been a loop. So we're just going to, we're going to come back. For it is better to suffer for doing good than if, then, uh, if it, for, guys, I'm sorry for this ployable moment. I'm going to try again. Here we go. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. What if I told you that doing good in the eyes of God and doing good in the eyes of man are two different things? What if I told you that it's not about the attention you get online? So much of today is obsessed with how many likes, how many shares. Subscribe and bell this channel so that you get notifications about how to link and read stuff or something. We, as a generation, and I'm not talking millennials or uh, Gen Xers or Gen Zers or Gen Boomer, I guess. It doesn't matter. We are fighting, all of us, tooth and nail for attention. Let me show you what a real Christian seeks his face. See that? There's nobody there. Because the truth is, when a real Christian is present, we don't brag about it. We shouldn't seek to glorify it on Facebook. Yeah. I know. It's hard. It's one of those things that's crazy about the Internet. We all want validation through somebody else saying, you did good. Press the thumbs up button. But the truth is, if you heard those words that were spoken from his scripture and they did anything to you in terms of your heart, then congratulations. You're a believer. And you have a responsibility to be invisible. Because the only recognition we ever should get is entirely in the hands of God. That is to say, every ounce of glory, every ounce of respect or admiration should be directly and immediately pointed straight to Christ. I'm pointing over there because there's a cross out of frame that you guys can't see. But it's over there, okay? Just, just trust me on it. Um, when, when we point to Christ, if somebody looks at me and says, Oh, Mr. Patrick, you did really great on that Bible study last fort day. That's a day. 
Uh, I really liked how, how you made quarters a really important part because I've been collecting quarters. I have 49 of the 50 state quarters. Did you know that? That's so cool. And I'm so cool because of it. When somebody looks at me and starts trying to compliment me, I say, I, uh, okay, hold on. I try to say, oh, it's not me, it's Jesus. He just uses me like a puppet. You know the puppets on a string? Somebody moves my arm. <laughs> That's who we should be in Christ. Because we aren't the puppeteers. We aren't the true agents of ultimate glory. We're His. And we always will be. So today, as you go forward and, and you worship with us, whether you're watching online or you're uh, here in person, I thank you. And I pray that today you turn toward Christ because the truth is all of us go astray. All of us move away from where we should be and keep trying to do it the old way. Oh man, I've really wandered off. Where am I? I, I know what's going on here. I'm just chasing Hey, can I get 47 more likes? Is this good for me? Does this shot make my nose look big? Like this video if you think that my nose looks good. What does God want from us? Truth is, it doesn't matter what God wants from us. It's not about how uh, God is going to bless you what he's going to give you. It's about what you know of God. When you recognize who God is and the sacrifice that his son, Jesus Christ, paid for us. Love, kindness, decency, respect, all of this flows from you. Because He's in you. It's not perfect, because we're not perfect. But it's in a great direction. So as we sign off for today, I just want to pray with you, and then I implore you to join us at 1045. Doors open at 1030. Um, and Facebook will go live at 1040 um, to join us for worship today. Have a great day, and let's pray. Father God, if anybody is in the hearing or the sight of this video, I pray that you move through the zeros and the ones. Move me out of the way and take your glory to the hearts and minds of those who listen. God, I'm not good at what I do. Mostly because I don't do it well enough. So please, God, I beg you, Please, reach someone today. Please. In Jesus' name, amen.